heavens and the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. I'm good. How are you? Good. You doing well? Awesome. You look good. Man, there's like 800 people here today. That's crazy. Obviously, you got the memo. Yep. Didn't cancel the service. We're here. We're here in person. Um, yeah. So if you got your Bibles, let's go. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verses 7. This is tripping me out because normally Easter is the big service. Why is it that the two Sundays following Easter have been larger than Easter? I know why. It's because you guys all went to different churches on Easter, you guys all went to the pursuit, didn't you? I knew it. I thought I saw you in their photos. Russell's taking like pictures of Ezra Sears in their service. I'm like, ah, Darren, ah, look at, okay, good, good, good. All right, Genesis, <laughs> Genesis chapter, Russell would do that. Genesis chapter three, uh, verse six. Um, listen, um, there's people here today, I'm talking about you, um, and you have done um, some bad stuff, but you've stopped doing it now you're doing good stuff. You remember the days when you used to do the bad stuff. Some of you, your old days creep up and you're reminded of your old days and you get a little bummed out. And then you decide, I should do something really good and nice for somebody so that I can kind of make up for some of the bad stuff that I did in, in the past. Okay, and, and then some of you, you're actually, you're, you're, you're here and thank God everybody that's here is here, but some of you, um, you're here and you're actually still doing bad stuff and uh, maybe people know about it and, or maybe nobody knows about it, but you're here and, and, and you're still making what my wife calls unwise choices, okay? <laughs> and, um, you know, and so from time to time, you, you, you try to do something good. You try to convince yourself that you're not a bad person. You're just, you're just doing some shady stuff, right? And, um, you know, and, and there are other people that are doing worse things than you. It's not like you're a serial killer or something. <laughs> All right, hopefully not. All right, you know, but, but uh, you know, but at least you're not like, at least, at least you're not like that guy, Dexter Morgan. So anyways, um, you know, the two of you laughed. So anyways, today we're talking about sin and consequences, <laughs> you know, and that there's consequences to sin and, um, but that our great God has come up with a brilliant solution. And it's gonna, this is going to be like the best church service ever. You're going to be so glad you came. You're going to be so glad you didn't go to that other church. So anyways, um, the pursuit. So anyways, um, the, Bible says, the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We've all done some stupid stuff. And that's what we all have in common here is that we've all done um, some stupid stuff. That doesn't make you stupid. It just means that you've done, you've done some things. You know, I, I've done some things. Um, in fact, my grandpa pastored here. My dad pastored here. I swore I would never pastor here. I just didn't think that I'd ever pay enough. So anyways, um, <laughs> but, like I remember back in the, so I got a buddy that I was raised here with and he's, he's back in that closet there doing all the editing, all the video work. His, his, his name is Michael Kabisky. Um, I used to call him, yeah. <laughs> Michael, don't come out and take a bow because I'm about to tell a story about us. So anyways, <laughs> just hide. Hide. So I used to call him Mikey. That was my buddy, Mikey. Now, this must have been like 88, 89. I, we must have been like six years old, six or seven years old. And our dads were up here. They were building the building up here, right? And so we were downstairs playing. And because this was like our fortress, like this, like this place was being built. There's wood everywhere, nails. Like we could just build stuff. It was awesome. This is like the coolest place to be raised. Anyway, so we're downstairs. I don't know what we're doing. Um, but we, like, we literally made ourselves at home here, okay? And so um, we were making ourselves at home, and apparently we both had to use the bathroom at the same time. And because we're just making ourselves at home, and I won't tell you what room we were in, um, but we that these heaters in the room were going to be um, urinals. 
It's not, it's not that gross. We had our own heaters, you know, like vents, you know, like the little vents in the ground. And so um, we, uh, we peed in the, in the heaters, okay? Mikey and I. <laughs> and here's the thing, nobody knew. Nobody knew what we had done. There, this is before IP cameras. This is before, you know what I'm saying? Nobody knew what we had done. I mean, and so nobody's going to pin that on us except for, and now my memory, you know how your memory is. It's, it's hard to, things change over time. But my memory says that it wasn't but minutes that our, both of our dads came walking in the room. And I don't know how they knew, but they knew. In fact, I don't remember my dad ever asking me if I did it. He took me right to his office. He bent me over his lap. Here, in my family, I would rather get a mom spanking than a dad spanking. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't believe in spankings. How are your kids doing? I'm just, all right, that was very nice. That was very nice. That, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Normally the 6 p.m. get this kind of behavior. I, I, I do. I, I apologize. You guys. <laughs> Sin and consequences, right? Man, no such thing as millennial consequences these days, right? Like, oh my gosh. You, you know, you sin, you get a blue ribbon. All right, good time. Anyways, uh, at least you... Uh, I got a dad spanking and it, and it hurt. And I remember I met up with Mikey and he had tears in his eyes. And he said to me, did you get a spanking too? I said, yeah. And, and how our dads knew, I have no idea. This is what we're going to be kind of looking at today. So it's a little bit, little, little bit, little bit different. But it's like dad knew what his kids did. And it, and it, kind, of, and it kind of changed everything. Sin, sin and consequences. Okay? There's consequences to the decisions um, that we make. Now, a few weeks ago, we were in this text, in this uh, book of Genesis. And, uh, and as you know, we've been going through the book of Genesis, um, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So we started this in the fall of last year, you guys. Um, and we're only in the third chapter. Okay? Which means that at this rate, when we're done with Genesis, I'm going to retire, get a bass boat, and move to Austin. That'll be good. All right? Now, last time we did our study together, we studied the serpent. That was kind of an important message. I'm going to do a quick review, but if you're new here or if you're like a baby Christian, if you're new to the faith, I'm going to honor you by including you into some pretty deep stuff. Um, this isn't going to be milk, okay? This is going to be steak. If you haven't yet developed your teeth yet, it's okay. You can gnaw away at this with your, with your gums. But I'm, I'm not going to treat you like your babies today. I'm going to treat you like your adults today, and we're going to catch you up. And if you're like, I don't believe that, that's fine. You're a powerful person. I, I don't expect for you to believe everything that I believe in order for you to attend the church. Not even my wife and I agree on, on everything that we say 100%. You know, so um, 100% compliance is not required to be a part of this church. Now, before you get too excited, you do have to believe in the Word of God and Jesus the Christ, that He literally died, resurrected, and ascended. Like, you know, we're not including Buddha on this stage, okay? We're not like, always get you to heaven. No, the problem with that is the Bible, okay? So we still believe in the Bible. There's still things I'm willing to fight for, bleed for, and die for. So don't get too excited, okay? But, um, <laughs> but when it comes to the serpent, you have to realize that most of us have been taught kind of a Walt Disney version of Genesis, okay? which is basically you got this animal kingdom and you've got this place called Eden, which is a magical garden. And, um, and I guess Adam and Eve just sleep on the grass every night. And in this magical garden is a talking, walking snake who convinces Eve to eat of an apple tree. And she gives the apple to her husband. It causes a cosmic terror until Jesus comes. For most of us, that's what we've been taught about the book of Genesis. Now, a few things. Eden was not a garden. Okay, um, it says that God planted in Eden a garden. So there was Eden and God put a garden in Eden. Why is that important? It's important because as we've been studying, and this is just review, as we've been studying about Eden, there are these very important aspects in Eden, these clues that are given to us regarding rivers, earthly rivers and celestial rivers. We also read of various kinds of gemstones that existed here in Eden. It's also important that you know that the, that 
the book of Genesis is not the only book that talks about Eden. Eden is also mentioned in Isaiah as well as Ezekiel. And we see a description of heaven and revelation that looks very, very similar to Eden. In that it refers to rivers. It refers to God's throne. It refers to the same gemstones that were also in Eden. Why is that important? Because we have to use the entire Bible to interpret Scripture. It's very dangerous when you only take one passage and you try to define that passage within itself. Scripture interprets Scripture. So for those of you that have been taught that there was this garden with a walking, talking snake that hated humans, and that's why snakes are the worst of all creatures, amen, this walking, talking snake got Eve to eat of a magic red apple that Adam also consumed. God got mad at the snake. Anyways, this is the Sunday when we study why snakes lost their legs and stopped talking. This is the journey that we're about to, uh, to go on. You ready? Here we go. And by the way, God's going to, there's going to be some implications um, because of sin not just to the serpent, but also to the woman and also to the man. All right, Genesis th uh, 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit. No, Eve, don't do it. No, 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 no. Okay, and she ate it. No! And I, just let me get into it. Don't judge, Okay. And then she was like, ooh la la. And she also gave some to her husband. You gotta try this, babe. No, don't do it. And what did he do? He also ate it. Ah, dude, bro, ah, uh, wrong. Bad move, unwise choice, okay? Verse seven, then their eyes were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they began to sew fig leaves together and they made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. Why? Because I was naked. And I hid myself. And then God responded, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I have commanded you not to eat? Verse 12. The man said, It was that woman you gave me. Immediately throws the woman under the bus, right off, right off the bat. Not just the woman, God's like, Adam, what have you done? And Adam's like, it was that woman, first of all, blames the woman, who you gave to me. So immediately in one short sentence, he throws Eve under the bus and then throws God under the bus. She gave me the fruit of the tree. And so I logically ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. Now what's interesting is that God comes walking in the cool of the day and there's Adam, okay? Um, and the woman, the woman has not yet been named. In fact, next week is Mother's Day and we are gonna study chapter three, verse 20 and the origin of motherhood. Now let me just say that motherhood has has a lot to do with having your own biological children, but there's more to it than that, that motherhood is a blessing to all females regarding of your, of your ability to have children. That motherhood is a grace and a high call of the Lord. And with it comes authority and it's huge. So next week, Mother's Day, little plug, the origin of motherhood. It's for all females, not just those with, with children, okay? Now, there's man and woman together, and what does the Lord do? The Lord turns to the serpent. What does that mean? It means that the serpent was also there. 
and the serpent didn't flee when God came into the, into the garden. Why? Because God was used to being in the presence of the serpent, and the serpent was used to being in the presence of God. Now, as we reviewed earlier, the serpent was not a part of the animal kingdom, okay? Uh, this serpent was a divine being. We see that um, uh, uh, the, the name in the Hebrew for this is not snake, it's nakash. It's three different Hebrew letters. We've got a noun, a verb, and an adjective. The adjective means the shining one. What we see here, now this is review for you. Um, when you begin to study Eden and the serpent, you will see Genesis 3. You will see Ezekiel chapter 28. And you will also see in Isaiah 14, reference to the shining one. People say, well, is this Lucifer? The name Lucifer is not used anywhere in the Bible. The word Lucifer is an adjective referring to a shining one coming from the word luminosity or to shine, to bring forth. The word that we use for Satan, the Satan, simply means adversary, okay? So you have the name for the enemy as adversary or the shining one. We do see in the passage that I just noted, they all take place in Eden. They always refer to this shining one, this, this luminescent one, this, um, this, this divine being. And we see here um, uh, 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 that the Lord is about to address this divine uh, being. And he says, because you have done this, because you have deceived these guys, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you should go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. This is the curse upon the Nakash. He says here, you will crawl on your belly. This does not refer to a snake losing limbs. Nowhere do we see it say here that because you have done this, I will remove your legs. And so when it says here, from this point on, you'll crawl on your belly, in the ancient text here, this would read of a divine being being forced down to get down, to lie down, to fall down, or to crawl away. Uh, somebody asked me just recently, um, uh, isn't it true that snakes have these bone cartilage that have been found in the backside of the snake, which is proof that snakes used to have legs? No, that's evolutionary theory that's tried to tie all snakes to birds. And it's tried to show how um, all reptiles had at least two legs because there's only two bone spurs in the backside of the snake. The problem with this evolutionary theory is that those spurs, these little pieces of cartilage are not connected to the skeleton whatsoever. So if they were legs, they wouldn't support the, 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 the being. And so um, that has been discounted by science. Not all snakes have those, by the way. There's only a select line of snakes. So we can't take this and put it into our theology that all snakes have legs. They used to talk. They used to walk. And this is where, this is where God took away their legs. No, this is not a snake. This is a divine being, part of a uh, 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 Isaiah and Ezekiel say, a guardian cherub, a part of the divine council, this serpentine being is there because it is legally allowed to be there. And as you read Isaiah, you see this declaration of this beautiful guardian um, being, um, uh, 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 Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, uh, this shining one, and it says, I will ascend with great pride in its heart. It says, I will be like God. I will ascend the mountain of God. I will ascend above the assembly of God's headquarters. This is, this is a rebellious uh, seraphim, a, a cherub, a divine throne guardian covered in gemstones. We even read of, of plumbing within its, within its biology where it literally had 
instruments that were plumbed into it. This divine guardian cherub was actually an instrument uh, in and of himself. And we see here, this thing is saying, with great pride in his heart, I will ascend. I will ascend the mountain of God. I will go up. I will be high. And what God says here is, uh, because you've done this, cursed are you. On your belly you shall go. I am casting you down onto your face to lie down, to crawl away. You will not be upright in an attack position, but you will be, you will be struck down in a docile position. I am humbling you. You have great pride in your heart, and God says, cursed are you. I will humble you. And that is what God does here. And then he says, on your belly you shall go, and dust you will eat. Dust not referring to, this is going to be your new diet, dirt, because it took away your legs, and now you're going to have your big long tongue just eating dirt all the, day, all, all the way, because in the old days, snakes used to eat bird. No, 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 no th this doesn't have anything to do with diet. This has everything to do with the realm of dust being cast down, humbled. Job chapter 17, verse 16, speaks of Sheol, or, uh, uh, or what we would refer to as hell, being the place of dust. We see in Isaiah 26, verse 19, that those who dwell in Sheol are dwellers of dust. Those that are in this realm being dwellers of, we see this rebellious seraphim being cast down out of the divine counsel of God, out of Eden into the lowliest, most humiliating parts of the chaos, of the cosmos, the realm of the grave, the realm of the dead, the realm of dust. Isaiah 14, it refers to this moment that we see in Eden. Ezekiel 28, talking again about Eden and the assembly of God's headquarters and this place of being struck down, being thrown down into the realm of the dead. So, yes, I believe that what we see here are two falls. We see the fall of Adam and humanity, and we also see the fall of the, 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 the guardian cherub, um, the, the, the luminary one, the, the bronze one, the fall of Lucifer, the fall of the adversary. Now, part of us, we wrestle with this idea because as Americans, we think heaven up, up in the air, so when we see Satan being cast down, we see him being thrown out of heaven and then being cast down maybe into the earth or maybe down into, into Sheol. But what we actually have here is we have Eden, which is the place of convergence, where heaven and earth are actually together. So yes, we do have the mountain of God, which is, which is up, but it's not separated, not yet. We have heaven and earth coming together, which is why Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, that it be on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because when you get to Revelation, that's how the book ends. The book ends like it began. The restoration of all things, which means that heaven's no longer up somewhere out there, separate somewhere out there, you know, that, that now Heaven has come. His will has been done. His kingdom has fully come. It's been inaugurated by the return of Christ, the new and heavenly Jerusalem, the lion and the lamb. Great justice and judgment brought upon the earth, right? And we see this place of the, the, the bride ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus, the, the marriage supper of the lamb, the return and restoration of Eden on earth. And so we see in the beginning, Lucifer being cast out of Eden, cast out of the dwelling, the habitat of God, the very place of the, the, the central location of God's headquarters with his divine counsel and the, the, and the shining one being thrown out of the divine counsel, out of Eden and into the realm of dust which the Hebrews would see as, a, as, a, as the realm of the grave in the under earth. You can Google this, um, and maybe we might be able to get to it, but um, you can Google um, ancient 
Hebrew cosmology, and you can get a graph of how the ancient Hebrews would have viewed the earth. It's different uh, than what we have now because of our satellite imagery. But you can clearly see the earth realm. You can clearly see the firmament, the lens of God. It's held up by the mountains, which are the mountains of God. You can clearly see the realm of the grave, the realm of Sheol. And then you see underneath that, the waters beneath and the waters above. And so we see here, uh, cursed are you. You tried to ascend, and instead you will descend. You allowed pride to come into your heart, and now I will humble you. And now your diet will consist of the realm of the grave. You are no longer allowed to partner with the realm of life and liberty. You are now the Lord of darkness, the Lord of dust. And then we see he says, I will put hatred and hostility between you and the woman. You know, for some of you, th this has always made sense. This is always the, the text. This is why females hate reptiles. <laughs> I will put hatred between females and snakes. That's how we've read this text for many, many years. And now you can see that, and honestly, this is why I believe and that there is such a call the war and the women of God. I feel like there's almost like a liberty in intercession as you see this great animosity that's going to occur between, between the Lord of darkness and the woman. And he says here, there will be great hostility, great hatred between you and the woman and he says, and between your offspring, we can translate that as seed, and also her seed. W women don't have seed. So what's he talking about? He's referring to, at this moment, there will be great hostility between your offspring and Jesus the Christ who is going to come through this woman whom you've deceived. Interesting, don't tell anybody, Troy Brewer's coming in June. I warned you. Okay, so Annie's going to do a star party. You say, what's a star party? Troy's got, this is awesome. He's going to go through the 12 constellations, okay, of our, of our galaxy. And the first one that he'll probably talk about is Virgo the Virgin. Why is it that Virgo the Virgin has an olive branch in her womb? Virgins don't have seed. Why is it the first constellation shows us a virgin with a seed? Some of you guys know Patricia King. She used to be a big New Ager. You say, how did she get saved? She got saved from the stars. She saw that the gospel was in the constellations. This is what you're, this is what you're seeing here. There will be great hatred and hostility between your seed and the seed of the woman, which is Jesus the Christ. A man would not be needed for the birth of Jesus. That our father would bypass a human bloodline and that Jesus would be born to a virgin um, without much help from Joseph. All right. And then it says, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is referring to the Christ, Jesus. This is referring to uh, the very first mention of the Proto-Evangelium, God's first announcement of a Savior, that from this woman would come a Redeemer, right? And it's going to appear as though the snake has bit and wounded this Redeemer. But this Redeemer would strike a death blow to the adversary with the power of the cross and the resurrection. You will rise up to attack. You will bite and he will turn and crush your skull. Defeating single-handedly sin, sickness, disease and death, all of the effects 
of the great fracturing of the cosmos from our first mother and father's rebellion against God, our God, at the very beginning with the institution of a curse declares a solution to the curse. His very own son would come and be cursed so that we could live life abundantly in union and restoration with Eden in our hearts. No more separation. The forgiveness, the reconciliation of all of this chaos being mended. Yeah? Amen. And then he said to the woman, so he's addressed the serpent, and then he looks at the woman, and he says, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Okay, we've got four children, and let me just tell you, that part's true. Okay? Uh, having children, I, and, and, and I don't, okay, you'd have, I, I just take my wife's word for it. Like, this is what I know. It's painful. It's painful. And, um, and some people say they've figured out the way to have, you know, painless births. Like, that's awesome. We never necessarily figured that out. You know, uh, Pastor Darren, how do we bypass that part? You know, you know sh sure, some good worship, some meditation, and epidural. Okay, here we go. And so we see that I will surely multiply. I'm sorry, natural paths, you know, uh, you know, don't throw your granola at me. Here we go. So I will surely multiply, <laughs> okay, pain and childbearing and, 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 and having children. Um, and it says, and your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. They had eaten of the knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and in a moment, they were completely overwhelmed with a torrent of overwhelming information regarding their frailness, their pride, their fallenness, and a moment completely crushed with a plethora of knowledge that they cannot handle. Ah, I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Too bad. You sin. Here comes the truth. Ah, ah, we're so bad. We're bad. We're evil. We screwed everything up. Yes, you did. And not only do you know how bad and naked and sinful and shameful you are, you know how bad, sick, and naked, and shameful your spouse is. This is a lot of information. This is a lot of knowledge. This is a lot of fallenness. This is a lot of pride. This is a lot of fear. This is a lot of shame. And what the Lord says to the woman is, your desire will be contrary to your husband. Yes, why? Because you're no longer in union. That when they sinned against God, for the very first time we had a rivalry between the husband and his wife and between humanity, humanity and God. The moment God showed up, Adam threw his wife under the bus. The very, that's, the very, that's the very first proof, the evidence of their fallenness. Look how quick he was to be like, it was that woman. And it was you. Rivalry, disconnection, discord, different thoughts, different intent, different all, all of this. And it says here, you will, you will no longer be in union. You will be disconnected. And in this place of disconnection, in this place of frustration, your husband will rule over you. Now, this is not a commandment, men, to rule over your wives. I am your husband. And Genesis 3 says to rule over you. Paul says, woman, submit. So, man, where my cheesecake? <laughs> this is not a commandment for husbands to rule over their wives. This is God saying, because of what you've done, this is the new reality. But we do see that very clear passages in the scriptures as far as how a Christian man ought to treat his wife. There is no scripture verse in the Bible that can be held in the context of scripture 
that justifies the ill treatment of our spouse. There is nowhere in the Bible where you get to lord your authority over your wife, where you are justified to sexually abuse, to physically abuse, to psychologically abuse your wife. That is the wrong religion. In fact, I can give you scripture verses where God says, if you don't treat my daughter well, I won't even be hearing your prayers. You'll be praying your head off and I won't have a word of it. Listen, man. You are not just married to a woman. You are married to a daughter of the king. You better love your wife like Christ loved the church, laying your life down for her. But I am to rule in the subservient role. I am in charge. I am the spokesperson for my family. You need to go pre-Genesis 3 and see that God had given them an equal mandate to rule and reign together. That they were given the same mandate. They were given the same call. They were given the same authority. So you cannot use the results of the curse and fallenness to dictate how you're going to lead within your home. We can do better. And the Christian church can do better. In fact, if you ever have to tell your wife and you're serious that you need to submit, no, dude, you need to repent. If you ever have to remind your wife of your authority, brother, you have no authority. You need to get on your knees. You need to cry out for forgiveness. That is abuse. That is spiritual abuse. It is a sin. It is wrong. So we see here that the Lord says, because of your sin, there will be division. But we don't say, well, he said there'll be division. That's why we're so divided. No, because we don't get to use the curse to define the new norm. Why? Because Jesus. <laughs> now I'm ahead of myself, but Jesus changed everything. The curse does not define the atmosphere in your home. Yeah, but it said, no, 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 no. Jesus changed everything. And that's why in the very beginning we see Jesus. This is why we see in the very beginning. God says, this is the way it's going to be for a while. But I am promising my promised one. Yeah. And then he says to Adam. <laughs> because Adam thought he had gotten away with it, right? Like God was talking to the serpent, okay? And then God's talking to the woman. And then Adam's like, I think I'm going to get out of this one. I mean, by the way, the woman's the one that, you know, God has hit, right? And the serpent, everyone knows it's the serpent's fault. I think we're good. So Adam's looking at God, he's like, we're good, right? We, we already talked. We're good, right? And God's like, uh, anyways. <laughs> and then God said to Adam, because you've listened to your wife. Now, we're not allowed to use this one either. <laughs> 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 this, has, this has context. You're not us. see, last time a man listened to his wife and screwed everything up, right? No, no, no. <laughs> he says, because you've listened to the voice of God and you've eaten of the tree, which I commanded you uh, not to eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall be, uh, bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. And you shall eat bread till you turn to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For you are dust, and to the dust you will return. That's what God says uh, to Adam. Um, before the ground used to produce for you. Before the ground was so easy. Like you had to work. Like God puts man to work before the fall. But it was like, it wasn't like work. It was like partnership. It was like, it was like fun. It was like amazing. The earth just like responded. And now this is what God says. Life is about to get very, very difficult. You took life for granted. Before, life was inevitable. You had a tree of life. You would eat from the tree of life. And life would be prolonged and sustained by the tree of life. But now God says, you are literally going to have to war for life. Like, if you don't work, you will die. Nothing is going to provide for you. If you are not working the ground, if you're not crushing it, in fact, this isn't just work, this is back breaking work. You are literally going to have to fight for your survival. The ground is going to war against you. Remember when the ground used to produce for you? 
Now there's going to be enemies coming out of the ground. These new things called thorns and thistles. They're there to get you. They are there to hate on you. Thorns and thistles. Look at us. Ah, poke him. Ah, got him. Ah. Okay? Isn't it interesting? Thorns and thistles, a part of the curse on the earth. And then our Savior was crowned with a crown of thorns and thistles that were shoved upon his head. The details in this story from, from the very origin of our Jewish roots, we see a prophetic drama of the coming Christ. We see the one who would become a curse so that we can step into a realm of connection, intimacy. We can step into this place where Eden can come and flood our hearts, where heaven can come. We see this place where Adam and Eve are disconnected in their hearts, where humanity is disconnected from the heart of God. And we see many years later through Moses a prophetic drama of a temple where there would be a veil or a curtain that separates unholy humanity from the holy of holies in the very presence of God. This being a metaphor, a, a prophetic picture, a shadow of Eden, now being separated by a curtain from the earth. This place where we would be separated by a veil. This place where we'd be separated by a membrane. And we see this incredible thing that takes place when Jesus dies and his blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat. And that great curtain is torn. And we see John the Beloved caught up into the heavens and he sees and gives us the record of the day when the new Jerusalem returns back to the earth and we get to see a restoration, a recalibration of our origin story. If you want to know where we're going, you got to go back to the beginning. Now, you and I can process sin just like Adam and Eve did, just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did before the cross. That means that we live every day underneath the shackles and underneath the yoke of the memory and record of all the stuff that we've done. If you were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all you had were these shadow practices of offering a, a blood sacrifice and, and killing a, a lamb and, and this place of, of, of God putting up with you for a season based off the fact that, that there's this drama of your sins being transferred onto an a, a innocent lamb and that that innocent lamb would be sacrificed in atonement for the sins that you committed. But it was temporary and it was, it was incomplete. And for many of us, we live our lives just like, just like so many people before Jesus came, we live with the record, the weight of the things that we have done. And, and we do these different things. Maybe we come to church or we do something good. You know, maybe that's the only reason why you vote Republican. It's because for a little while, you feel just a little bit better about yourself. <laughs> just kidding. You know, we, 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 we engineer these things, these ways of coping with what we've done. But can I tell you something? We are nothing like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are nothing like Moses. We are nothing like the judges that God used to, to redeem Israel. Why? Because for generations, the prophets prophesied that the Redeemer was coming and that he would make this right and that we would no longer have to go through priests and human mediators to kill a, a literal spotless lamb because the lamb would come. The, the man, the lamb, that God so loved the world that he was sending his, his, actually, his only son, that his son would come, Emmanuel, God with us, and he would not sin and he would not allow compromise 
compromise to fill his heart, that he would come, he would live, he would model kingdom, he would model heaven, and then he and his perfection would be unjustly murdered so that we in our imperfection could be justly forgiven and brought into the family of God. We do not have to live under shame. We do not have to live under regret. We do not have to live under grief. We do not have to live underneath the weight of these things. Why? Because Jesus has changed everything. That whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. When you believe in him, when you confess his name, when you say, I believe by faith, I don't have to experience anything, I don't have to feel anything, but by faith, I know that God, you are doing something. I don't have it all figured out. Half of what that preacher said seemed crazy, but there's some sort of truth knocking on my door. That truth is a person. That truth is Jesus. You don't have to atone for yourself. You don't have to make yourself better. You don't have to prove yourself. It's not justification through recycling. This is not you having to prove anything. This is you simply choosing to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you are a part. You are a part of the Word of God. You can find yourself in the story. Jesus came, and Jesus is coming again. And he will judge sin, sickness, disease. He will bring a great recalibration to this disorder. That in the beginning, for six days, for six days, he created by bringing cosmos out of chaos. And in one moment, in one decision, humanity set everything back out into chaos. And now he has called us, the church of Jesus Christ, the Ecclesia, the governing ones. He has given us his spirit. He has given us his ruach, that the same spirit that hovered in the Tohu Vavohu, the same spirit, the same presence that hovered has now been seated in you and I so that we can go into the chaos. We can go into the darkness. We can go into the fractureness. We can hover that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within you. That God has called us for such a time as this to be salt, to be light, to say that we are not powerless. We are powerful. We have a voice. We can make wise choices. We can go. We can make mistakes. We can fail. We can fall. But we cannot be failures because we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. When we forget where we came from, we will forget where we're going. That we are part of a story. We've got a future and we've got a hope. God has called you for such a time as this. He has saved you for such a time as this. He has filled you with his spirit for such a time as this. The earth is in need of you. America is in need of you. The nations are in need of you. Your school is in need of you. Your workplace is in need of you. And all you need is him. You don't need another degree. You don't need another job. You don't need a different wife. You don't need different children. All you need is Jesus. And if you, not religion, there's a big difference between religion and Jesus. Religion will keep you out of relationship with Jesus. Religion will keep you out of relationship with people. Religion will keep you out of relationship with your own spouse. Religion will trick you into performing all the days of your life while inwardly feeling like a hypocrite. God doesn't want you to act your age. He doesn't want you to act like a better person. He wants you to be fully you in Him. Yeah. And this is why Seattle Revival Center exists. We exist to see people awakened to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. Paul would say to the Colossians, he says, Christ is our message. He says, we preach so that every heart would be awakened to the full understanding of truth. You are a message. 
You are a sermon. Your story matters. Christ Jesus is our message. We preach that every heart would be awakened to the full understanding of truth. You're a minister. You are a priest. We are part of the great company of the priesthood of believers. You don't need Darren to be your middleman. I can't forgive you of your sins. Your sins were forgiven 2,000 years ago on the cross. Your sickness and disease was healed 2,000 years ago on the cross. What do you need to do? You need to put it on. You need to put on the revelation that I am healed. I am free. I am a son. I am not an alcoholic. I am not a pervert. I am not a cheat. I am a son of the Most High God. That's who I am. And I might not feel it, I might not feel healthy, but Christ, you are my healing. Christ, you are my purity. Christ, you are the solid rock on which I stand. Everything else is sinking sand. Let's stand to our feet. Declare with me right now, Christ is our message. We preach that every heart would be awakened to the full understanding of truth. Can we put up our hands in the air and just say, I surrender. I surrender my message. Christ, be my message. Let my life be a sermon. Let my life be a testimony. Use these hands. Use my voice. Use this story. Use my good. Use my bad. Use my ugly. Use all of it for your glory. Satan, you can no longer shame me. I will no longer try to cover my nakedness. I will no longer try to hide myself from my Father. He's not looking to punish me. He's looking to kiss me. He's looking to affirm me. I'll stop running. I surrender today. I surrender. Just let Jesus come to you. All through this room, King Jesus come. King Jesus come. Let your train fill this temple. Let us see you high and lifted up. Yeah. Come and cleanse our lips. Here we are. People watching online, King Jesus, step into people's living rooms and bedrooms, step into people's cars right now. King Jesus, begin to walk down every row, down every aisle right now. Come and touch people's hearts and heads and minds. Come and lift off every heavy yoke that is not of you. Come and lift off religious yokes that are not of you sinful yokes, yokes of addiction that are not of you. Come and lift them off, King Jesus. Even the yoke of anger, generational anger, being lifted off right now and cast, cast into the fire right now. The yoke of infirmity, the yoke of sickness and disease, being born into a bloodline of certain genetic ailments, Jesus, come and lift off right now that genetic yoke of infirmity right now. Come and lift it off. I said right now, lift it off. Yep, there it goes, right now. Lift it off right now. Lift it off right now. And throw it to the pit. Throw it in the fire right now, King Jesus.
And right now, as a priest, I declare to the spirit of rivalry, dissension, disagreement, gossip, and slander, that spirit that comes to divide, that spirit that comes to divide marriages and relationships, that comes to divide the great dream of God that can only be executed when there's two or more that are gathered together and in agreement. I speak to that spirit of rivalry and division, gossip, slander, that thing that comes to cut down and reduce each other. I speak to that spirit. You are not of the Holy Spirit. You are a demon from the pit of hell. You've been spotted. You have the right to remain silent, to shut your face. I command you right now to come up and out and cast you to the pit right now in Jesus' name. We cast you to the pit right now in Jesus' name. You cannot have our home. You cannot have our marriage. You cannot have our destiny. You cannot have our identity. My spouse, my lover, my friend, my fighter, we are in this together. We will not fight against each other. We will fight for each other. The devil is a liar. No, no, no. We take Option D, divorce off the list right now. And we add a new option, option A, union. I ask Jesus for a grace to forgive. I ask for a grace for perspective. I ask for a prophetic perspective in our homes and our marriages that we would not operate out of a punitive old cut of covenant. Punishment, wrath based theology within our parenting or within our marriages, we choose to stop punishing our spouse for what they did 20 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. We give them to Christ right now. We choose to have a culture where our children don't have to hide their sin from us, where our children don't have to hide their nakedness from us to create a culture in our home where our children don't hide themselves from us. Father, fill us with your love, fill us with your heart, a countenance of grace, a posture of forgiveness. Would you just put your hand on your heart? Father God, we as that we would guard our hearts. Solomon would say that our heart is a wellspring of life. We ask that you would guard our hearts from any unforgiveness, bitterness, any hurts from the past. We ask that you would heal our hearts in a way that only you can. And I thank you. Deeper, Lord. Go deeper, Lord. Go deeper, Lord. Heal. Transform. Remove all fear from our hearts. Give us your heart, King Jesus. Come deeper, Lord. More, Lord. You're so good. More, Lord. More, Lord. Never the same, Lord. Never the same. 
Just one touch from you changes everything. If you're a parent here, would you just pray with me? I feel like we're supposed to do this. Say, I decree. And then if you're a husband, say, as a father or as a mother, I'm taking back my home. Anxiety, you're gonna have to leave. Right now. Depression, you're gonna have to leave. You can't stay any longer. I'm serving you an eviction notice. I declare 100% liberty over the hearts of my children. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now. How many of you felt something shift? Just wave at me. Just felt something change. Awesome, awesome. Listen now, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. But we have to renew our minds to catch up to the full reality of what Christ has done on the cross. Listen, you've been so brave this morning. You went on a very deep journey into a part of God's word where few have gone, but you've done it. God has done something holy and precious here in this service. Satan can't steal that from you. 